it never hurts to have somebody, an objective outsider with fresh eyes to look at what you're doing and say, hey, have you thought about maybe doing this instead? I think that for me specifically, that would have helped had I had that partner or mentor much earlier on. Welcome to In the Thick of It. I'm your host, Scott Hallra. On this episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with an old friend, Steve Derman. He is the founder and creative director of Four Man Furnace. In our chat, we dove into his background in the creative industry, starting with his early days as a graphic designer to his time at big agencies like Rap Collins Worldwide. Steve shares the challenges and joys of running his own agency, from assembling teams of contractors to the importance of creating work that not only looks good, but accomplishes the client's business objectives. We also discussed the impact of the pandemic on his business and lessons learned along the way. Welcome back to In the Thick of It. Steve, welcome to In the Thick of It. Thank you. Appreciate you you coming over. It was a long trek getting over to the office, right? Yeah. I mean, when when you set the meeting for two, I figured, man, I better leave the office by at the latest 155. (laughs) So... (laughs) So yeah, it was. Uh, it wasn't too hard to get here. Your whole like mile and a half from here. I don't if know if that, it's even that. It may long. not be. Yeah. Well, it's a shame that we don't see each other more often, given how close we are. I know. We'll have to make a point of it. Let's just you know, it starts today. Well, it starts today. All go. right. Sounds good. <laughs> well, with me today is Steve Derman, founder of Four Man Furnace. Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you guys do? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to describe it is we are a full service creative agency for marketing, advertising, and branding. So we like to say if you can click it, swipe it, fold it, or mail it, we can do it. That doesn't quite capture what our focus is these days, but in general, that sums up our full capabilities, which is print design, graphic design for print, digital, online marketing, branding, event event appearances or trade shows and those types of things. We spend a lot of time focusing these days on branding and video production. To the extent that your contracts will allow you, can you talk about some of the types of customers that you work with? Yeah, the details of the projects are under NDA, but I can talk about all of our clients. We have really, really good relationships with clients across a lot of different industry verticals. We were talking a little bit before you hit record about one of our clients in the um, beverage industry, Balcones Distilling down in Waco, Texas. We've done some really really lovely video work for them. Uh, We worked with Interactive Corp out of um, New York. They are the kind of conglomerate company that holds brands like Vimeo and Daily Beast and College Humor and Angie's companies. We also have worked a lot with Wyndham Hotels and Resorts and their various brands on branding and um, digital marketing and some video production there as well. And the Texas FFA Foundation is a long-term client of ours, uh, a nonprofit client. We've done a lot of work for it, tremendous volume of work for them. And it's all really, really beautiful, lovely stuff telling their story. So yeah, you can see it's travel and hospitality, food and beverage, nonprofit, you know, just big uh, corporations. Technology, Technology. Yeah, exactly. Uh, across the board. The common theme through all that work is really our ability to take the story, take kind of the essence of what the brand is or what the campaign or initiative is trying to convey and really understand what are the objectives this business is trying to accomplish. We're not in the business of just creating art, right? We like to think that what we create is often very artistic, but it's not in our line of work. It's not just creating something that's beautiful for the sake of creating something that's beautiful. It also has to accomplish a business objective. And so we like to call that work that works. And so what we really, the common thread through all these different clients is really that they've got a story to tell and they need to connect with an audience. And we see visual communications as the foundation for building authentic connections between a brand and a consumer. You mentioned at the start that you've got a pretty divorce, uh, diverse <laughs> portfolio. Leandra, <laughs> that was, I don't know if that was a Freudian slip. No, no, but, no, no, um, no. <laughs> Sorry. Very diverse portfolio of clients. Yeah. And you talk about Texas FFA to Vimeo. I mean, I don't know that you get much more broad on the spectrum than, than agriculture to high-tech video hosting. Yeah. I mean, some of the work we've done for IAC is strictly commercial work or internal comms work. Some of it is for their um, nonprofit IAC Fellows Program, which is has a shares a lot of the same attributes as the Texas FFA Foundation in the mm-hmm. sense that they provide kind of career and technical opportunities for high school and college age students. 
who that give them these opportunities to set them on a trajectory that gives them an advantage over not participating in the program. So, you know, all of the statistics on the Texas FFA experience being beneficial to the future outcomes of a high school student are similar to the benefits of the IAC fellowship and the trajectory that it puts those kids on in terms of future career success. So we always find kind of common themes that we can latch on to and leverage for new clients if possible. Sure. Yeah. Outside of the actual uh, creative side, do you guys get into the media buying and placement or is that kind of left up to the to Not the at all. No, we have a firm understanding of not how to do the media buying and the media placement, but what the implications are on the creative that we need to provide for those media buys. But that's a completely unique skill set in and of itself. And we've got some partners that we reach out to as we need to for that. If a client comes to us and says, hey, we have an idea for a campaign, we need the creative and we need somebody to kind of plan the whole program for us, we would bring partners to the table for that and we would handle the creative. Okay, makes sense. Well, let's go way back in time. Let's just start <laughs> okay. with some early stuff. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey. And yeah, it was kind of growing up in the Northeast in a beach community in the 80s and 90s was my idea of like, a, it was just a really great experience. I mean, I know it was New Jersey, so there's always that. But it was a great experience growing up and uh, had a big Jersey Italian family, lots of cousins and aunts and uncles. And um, it was just a really kind of tight knit kind of vibe growing up. It was cool. Does that mean that family gatherings were big and boisterous and full of food? And All of the above. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. You know, every stereotype that you would imagine, it was, you know, probably about 75% true. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> stereotypes are stereotypes for, for a reason. reason. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Uh, did you grow up in public school, private school? A little bit of both. I was in private school until about fifth grade. And it was in fifth grade, we moved kind of halfway across the state. And in Texas, that's a far journey. In New Jersey, it's like 45 minutes down the road. <laughs> but we moved about 45, 50 minutes away. And um, and so went into the public school system in about fifth grade, middle of fifth grade. Yeah. Okay. For our listeners that may be up in that area, what cities were you? The early years was in, uh, kind of the central part of New Jersey and Tom's River. And then we moved south to Ocean City, Summers Point, Atlantic City area. I've known you for more than 15, probably not quite 20 years. You you made yeah. your way to Texas at some point. How how did you wind up down here? It was kind of a, a whole sequence of events that happened really pretty quickly. I had graduated school with my degree in graphic design, was working in Atlantic City in a casino in their marketing department as their only in-house designer. And really in that two years, probably learned more than I did in four years of school about the design industry and print production and all of the things that I actually use on the job from that point forward. I wanted to get out of the in-house creative and get into an agency because I just knew I would learn a lot more and a lot faster there. There's not a big agency industry in South Jersey. So I was looking actually to move out to California where one of my cousins had, was living for a period of time. And as those plans were coalescing and I was getting ready to head out that way, he decided to move back to New Jersey. And so kind of pulled the rug out from under me a little bit. But at that same time, my dad took a job in Dallas and he was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go down to Dallas and, you know, that's kind of the next chapter for us. You're welcome to ride the coattails a little bit and try it out and see if it sticks. And here we are 23 years later. So, yeah, came down with my whole family, my sister, my parents. We all moved down here at once uh, in January of 2000. Wow. Okay. We've had a lot of growth, particularly in the last few years, but you were probably much on the early side compared to the growth that we've had in more recent times. So where did you go to college? I went to what's now called Stockton University. At the time, it was Stockton State College. It's a really small liberal arts school. Actually, I can't speak to how, I don't think it's much larger now than it was back in the 90s, but it's a really nice, intimate liberal arts college in kind of like south, southern part of central New Jersey, just kind of tucked away in the Pine Barrens. You wouldn't even see it if you were driving down the highway. One of the rules in that area, as I recall, is because it's a like a federal preserve, they're not allowed to build structures that are taller than the tops of the trees. So all the all of the really tall buildings are actually dug kind of into the ground. And, you know, if it's a three or four story building, it's actually you walk in on the third floor and then have to go down. So it's kind of a cool little situation. Their focus at the time, there were a lot of people going there for visual arts and natural conservation, like environmental sciences and things like that. So what was school like for you? Was it easy? Was it a challenge? No, school was always pretty easy for me. Just the, the whole, I think in terms of like 
inputs and outputs and formulas. And for an art guy, I also kind of have a very analytical, technical side of my brain. Um, and so school was always very, like, test taking was always easy for me. There's a code and a pattern to it that was always very simple. And since much of school and a lot of secondary education at the time as well was just kind of like passing tests, that was really easy for me. When it got into more of the artistic side that was a little more subjective, like portfolio reviews and and kind of more subjective creative analysis by your teachers and professors, that part was a little more challenging for me. I actually had to work. I had to do work. I actually had to try. And so that was nice. That was a challenge. And that's really where I got to, I think, put the majority of my effort was on, on those types of uh, classes. So I'm a little bit of an outsider to your, your industry, but it's something I've always been somewhat uh, intrigued by and at different points, maybe closer to there's the visual side, but then there's also the messaging side. Yeah. How much of your coursework focused on the words and the story versus yeah. the visual art? None. So for my degree in graphic design, it was, some of it was focused on the conceptual side of things, but not the writing side of things. It was all the visual side of things. And so it's really been something that I've learned on the job, you know, being a good writer, or at least at the minimum, a good editor of copy. It has been something that you're, I think it's part talent and part learned skill. You learn what works. And what we've learned over the last probably five to eight years as we've made, um, partnerships with other people in the marketing industry who focus more on behavioral economics of, of advertising has really helped us go a long way in terms of being able to work with writers as well as generate copy ourselves. That is kind of back to what I said earlier, the work that works, right? We know that we can't get somebody to change their behavior or take an action unless we get them to feel something. And so understanding kind of sometimes even subconsciously, what their goals are as it pertains to a service or to a product and being able to craft compelling copy around that is kind of the a workflow that has become important to us as creatives who work in the space of marketing and who have to try to compel people to even just stop and think about something, let alone make a decision. The copy is an incredibly important part of what we do. But it's been something that I've learned as I went because it's not something they were teaching graphic design majors and 1997. When you started school, did you go into school knowing that advertising was where you wanted to be, or did you have a different bent post-graduation? My intention going into college was to actually be more of an industrial designer, like working in, I had wanted to work in the aerospace industry, working kind of more like engineering design for airplanes and jets and whatnot. And quickly learn, like one of the first classes I had on that track was handwriting. You know how when you see those blueprints and schematics, it looks like the same guy wrote all of the notes on all of them. It's because they like hammer into you. This is how you write notes on a schematic. It's this, Literally, you're like, this you're learning you a draw font the basically. A. Yeah, you're learning a font, a handwritten font. And like, I had no and idea. so I went through that class and I was just like, I, this isn't creative enough for me. Like, I still love the engineering side of things, but this is not as kind of freewheeling and creative as I had wanted it to be. So did you start like with physics and some intro to engineering kind of classes? I was just feeling it out freshman year. I didn't take any physics or engineering. I got out of that track pretty quick. Okay. As soon as they were teaching me how to write in a font. I was just like, <laughs> I'm out of here. I mean, what's this graphic design thing? That seems a little more a little bit more my speed. Okay. And I guess before college, were you an artistic kid? Yeah, I was very artistic. Even in Junior high and high school, I was always anything art, drawing, illustration, and music. But those were the two things I was really, really interested in at that point in time. And so, yeah, I was creating my own comic books and doing my own illustrations, always drawing. Didn't go anywhere without a pen and a sketchbook. And it served you well. I guess. Okay. So we start in a casino as a one-person graphic designer. I want to actually pause on that for just a second. My first job out of school, I was a one-man marketing department for an aviation services company. Okay. And you talked about how you learned more in those two years than you did in your four years of school. Yeah. For people that are in college that might be listening – for me, I totally resonate with what you said. Yeah. I learned so much in, I was only with that company for a year. I learned so much. I got to do everything from 
buying media to working with creatives to putting on events to, I mean, you name it, I got to touch every aspect of marketing. And had I been in a larger firm and, you know, one person in a department of many, I'm sure I would have learned a lot of things from the other people. But I had to get in and figure it out on my own. And I learned so much from that. And so I don't know if that resonates being a department of one, but anyway. It, it, it was resonates a, big... a lot, especially in this day and age. Like I've had this conversation with my kids a few times just regarding just the college experience and the the investment of time and money versus what you get out of it. And everybody needs to make that decision for themselves. But if a kid in high school who's interested in graphic design and working in our industry came to me and said, which college should I go to? I would probably advise them, take a year and just do an internship. Walk into an agency, offer to intern for free for six months. They're not going to tell you no. And work there for six months and then decide, do I want to do this for another two years or do I want to spend a couple hundred grand and go to to college for four years to learn the same thing. I think there's a lot of opportunity for folks we didn't have in the mid 90s. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have a lot of the information that's available today to learn on your own. And if you're a self-starter and if you're motivated and you know what you want to do, I would suggest, as I've done to my kids, that give it a shot going that route. Because, I mean, for you and I, at least, we feel that we learned more on the job than we did in the classroom. And I think that's true for a lot of career paths. Yep, absolutely. All right. So it's 2000. You move to Dallas with your family. What happened next? Where did you go work wise? So I freelanced graphic design. I actually freelanced for the casino that I had left for a few months. I was looking around Dallas for a job at an agency because that was my intention for coming here and found uh, an agency called Rap Collins Worldwide, which was a direct marketing focused agency with a full service kind of suite of offering of creative services. So they did television spots and they did direct mail, print design, they did digital. And kind of as it was 2000, 2001, 2002, as kind of all these brands were starting to move online and figuring out what does advertising look like online? What does marketing look like online? All of the big agencies like RAP, which is an Omnicom agency, all of those big agencies were figuring out how do we sell these services? How do we create unique offerings? Um, and so I kind of learned as the industry went in that direction, I was, you know, an art director, a associate creative director, a creative director, kind of evolving my career as that industry evolved in, you know, the early 2000s with online, you know, digital design, experiential marketing, and all this stuff that was going on at the time. And so from 2000 till, I don't know, around 2006, 2007, I was work. it was actually through 2007, I was working at RAP, started just in their pre-production, what they called the digital studio. So creative team would send files down and my job would be get these things ready to go to the printer. So clean them up and make sure all the traps and bleeds and everything is set up the way that it needs to be set up so that when a printer gets this file, they don't have to mess with it. They can just get it on press. And I got to imagine your responsibilities grew over time. Pretty quickly. Yeah. I worked the swing shift. So they had so much work coming through the shop that they actually had the nine to five folks. And then they had like the, I think my shift was, I don't know, 11 to eight or noon to 9 PM or something like that. So I just worked the late shift, but I was able to get all the work done in just like a couple hours and then just kind of hang out and wait for other stuff to pop up. It wasn't a super challenging role for me. And then pretty quickly they were looking for more people to add to the creative team. So I moved from the digital studio to creative and then just kind of started hopping. When the digital started up, I had a I always had an interest in web design and digital creative. And so when they started their sub agency called Rap Digital, I raised my hand and said, hey, I want to go with these guys. And you saw the future. I don't know if I'm that smart. I don't think I saw the future. I just thought that that was cooler work to be doing. And so and the lead of that department, the creative director of that department saw me and was like, oh, I want this guy on my team. So it was kind of like, hey, yeah, let's do this. And so then that's where I kind of rose through the ranks over a couple of years, eventually held a seat as a creative director. And that's kind of the seat that I held until I left RAP. Interesting. Going back to working that swing shift, you said you could get your work done in a couple of hours and you're stuck there till eight, nine o'clock at night. I don't know, man, because that was like 2000. It was late 2000, maybe into early 2001. I think it was, anyway, it's not like there was like Facebook and Instagram to go kill time on. I honestly don't remember. I was probably partly just walking around the hallways, talking to other folks and kind of just 
shooting the breeze a little bit and maybe or almost definitely on like car forums reading about car stuff because that's a big hobby of mine. Okay, interesting. I just got to ask out of sheer curiosity for anybody that watched Mad Men or, you know, has looked at the industry at all. Like, what was the environment like there? It was not all that different from the tour you just gave me here at Venn, right? We had our fun spaces with Guitar Hero and poker tables and foosball and kitchens full. When I worked, um, not at Rap, but at, at the agency after that, we had Pepsi was a client, so fountain machines in the break rooms. And it's not Mad Men like 60s style ad agency, but it's what you would expect kind of like one of those types of companies to be especially when you're fostering creativity and creativity is very nonlinear and you can't just force somebody to sit in a cubicle and just, okay, design for eight hours or whatever. So it was a pretty fun environment. It was also those big agencies tend to be a little more sweatshop-like in terms of like, they don't care how long it takes you to do the work. Like if you've got to work 12 hours because you have a deadline tomorrow, because the creative process, it's not like, a linear progression of inputs and outputs. It requires inspiration. It requires kind of like sometimes just luck to come up with something that looks good. So some you'd see people there late at night burning the midnight oil because they just need to get something done. And then of course, because agencies sell hours, there's often non-billable tasks like RFPs and new business pitches. There's a lot of weekend work. That's one of the reasons I got out of the agency business and kind of started my own shop was just because that side of it wasn't attractive. Two weekends a month, I was working all weekend, and it was just on spec work for new business pitches, which was always some of the most fun work to work on because there's no rules, there's no mandatories, there's no limits to the creative. We're trying to show off. So it's as flashy and cool as we can make it, but that never sees the light of day. And so it was a little bit of a letdown at the end every time. So you would put out your best stuff and you'd win the work, but the client would say, let's go a different direction. Let's use the thing that you poured your heart and soul into? Usually not. Usually it's, we would swing for the fences and over deliver in the RFP. So the client may or may not have even been asking for spec work, but we were going to show it. Which by the way, when we work on RFPs now, we never do spec work, even if it's asked for. It's just not necessary. We have other ways of telling the story of how we would approach a project, but we would do all this spec work and it would just be swing for the fences. And so even if we did win the work, which is, I think back then it was probably almost half the time we would win the client then it would be, okay, now here's your creative brief. Now let's actually do the work. And it would always be a much more dumbed down version of what we did in the pitch. What was the coolest or craziest experience you had working for the big agency? Wow. There were a lot of cool experiences just traveling around. We had Toyota as a client back when they were still in California. I had Sony PlayStation as a client. We had Best Buy as a client. So I think one of the coolest experiences was just traveling to all these big corporate headquarters and seeing, you know, what is Best Buy's campus like in up there in Minneapolis? What was Toyota's campus like in California? And visiting clients on their turf at these global corporations that everybody knows and, you know, having meetings with the decision makers over there and selling them on creative ideas. Like, I don't know, that was always a really fun part of that job, especially as a young creative director that really didn't have a lot of reps. I don't think a lot of guys in the industry get put on a plane to California to go meet with Toyota by themselves when they've been a creative director for a year and a half. And you're how old at that point? 25, 26. Okay, man. When you would walk in at, you know, in your mid twenties, are people looking at you like, man, this guy's so green. What is, Probably. What is he doing I don't know. Like? I would, again, like I'm not that smart. So I don't have a lot of discernment in those situations to know better, like to read the room. So I would just go in with all sorts of audacity and probably unearned confidence, which was maybe part of why I was in the room, right? Is because I had that like blind confidence to just talk about things. I was always like, very confident about saying we could do work. And then when we would get it, I'd be like, crap, we got to figure out how to do this work. And <laughs> We won the business. Yeah. <laughs> now we have to figure out how to right. deliver. Oh, the client really likes this idea that I really didn't talk with the team about. So now I've got to go back and we've got to get it done. That was one of the memories I have or, or the series of memories I have is traveling to see these clients and just really feeling impressed by all these big campuses and headquarters and, and walking in those doors was always a cool feeling. Yeah. Being 25, 26 years old, getting to work in these huge brands, that had to have been super, super cool. 
Yeah. When you stay at an agency that long, like seven years, seven and a half years at an agency is like two careers for a creative to stay at one place that long. So I think part of it, I was kind of just used to it. We'd land a new client and it would be a big name, but I'd been working on PlayStation and Hyatt Hotels. So when we add DirecTV to the list, it's like, okay, well, it fits right in. That seems normal. So you kind of get used to it to a degree. If, if I was to lock in a Toyota now, I think I would, even having worked on Toyota 15 years ago, I would emotionally react to it a little bit differently, probably like I should have back then. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. So you were with big, big Omnicom agency for a long time. I think you said 2007, 2008 mm -hmm. is when you transitioned out. And where did you go from there? So I left in um, late 2007, went to another agency that doesn't exist anymore here in Dallas. At the time, it was called IMC Squared. They'd rebranded and then sold, and now they got absorbed. But I was working there on Procter & Gamble brands, primarily feminine care products, always Tampax and Prilosec OTC. I can't relate to several of those, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> Prilosec is a part of my regular regimen. So yeah. anyway, glad they got that product to market. Yeah. And the femcare stuff was uh, an education for me again as well. It, like, What was that like being a man working with products that are not made for men? I think it was part of the challenge of just really understanding a brand's, you know, like the unique value they bring to their target audience and just messaging or building campaigns and creative around that, right? Like, so that's just the skill. That's just what we do. I don't have to have heartburn to sell Prilosec OTC, right? I don't need to use these products to be able to sell them. So many, like most of the clients we've had have been, at least at Four Man Furnace in the last several years, have been products or services that I can relate to. But we've very frequently had clients that I can't relate to the product or the service. It's the skill of what we do is being able to message around that. So, but that was early on. I think for me, it was the greater challenge is that for the femcare brands, what their insight was that if we get girls to use this product in middle school, they'll continue to use it throughout their life. Whatever the first product is they use, that's what they use. And so we were building a campaign to seventh grade girls, which was, that was the challenge to me as a 20, late twenties dude working at an agency. Yeah, that was interesting. So I'm 41 and in probably 97 or 98, Gillette, the razor company, came out with the Mach 3 mm -hmm. razor system. And I'm pretty sure that they got a list of every... Six, you just got one in the mail. You got one in the mail. When you turned 18. It was probably a little bit earlier than that. Maybe. They, they got a list of every, yeah. you know, 16, I 17. I got one too when uh, back in the 90s when I turned, I, I guess, yeah, 16, 17. I just got a razor in the mail. Yeah. I can't imagine the investment that they made in that mail out. Yeah. And product that they weren't getting paid for. But I bought Mach 3 razors for years, for probably 10 plus years. Yep. And so it's amazing that things like that you get stuck on early in your life and you just you stick with it for a really long time. Yeah, that was the same insight for the femcare stuff is the first one they use. It's just like for whatever reason, they just tend to keep using it. That's a wow investment that pays long, long term dividends. Okay. So. You're at another agency. From there, did you go off and start your own firm? It is, yeah. From IMC Squared is uh, where I left and started Four Man Furnace. The team I was on at IMC was a bit of a wreck in terms of the process. And I don't think some of the people who were planning the process didn't quite understand how the creative side of things worked. It wasn't a good fit for me. And around that time, I was still tw like 27 maybe. And not really ready to be done being a creative, right? Like I was sitting in meetings. I, I wasn't doing any creative. I was sitting in meetings. I was Business. directing my team of creatives. I was the one on the call selling the creative to the clients. So wait a second, you're 27 and you're already at the point that you are leading other creatives. Yeah. I mean, that was the same at rap. I literally had a conversation with the the creative director, I don't remember her exact title, but she was from corporate. So she was the creative director over all of North America rap. Um, and she came in my office and was wanting to give me additional responsibility. And I sat there and I told her, I said, I don't know if I want this because as it is, I don't really do any creative anymore. And I'm not ready to be done with that. I'm still a designer. I still like pushing the pixels. Was that the impetus for you leaving rap and going to IMC Squared? 
it was around that time. I don't know if that was the impetus, so to speak, but it was around that time that I was becoming dissatisfied. And like I said, seven and a half years at an agency for a creative is two careers. So I was there long enough. And so, yeah, I mean, same thing at IMC Squared. I was in meetings. I was talking to clients. I was helping review creative briefs. I was, you know, overseeing some process stuff, but not doing any creative. And so to scratch that itch, I had clients on the side. I had built up my side business. I was working a full day at the agency and then going home and working a full day at night. And it just wasn't sustainable. And one of those two things had to give. And at this point, you're married. Married, just found out my wife was pregnant with Wesley, our firstborn. Okay. And I decided to quit my job. <laughs> All right. So that right there, I decided to quit my job. I want to dig into that. Okay. What was the moment that it was like, boom, okay, here it is. I'm gone. I'm going. I think it was that moment probably happened in a conversation with my wife after I was just completely exhausted. I remember it might not have been this instance, but I remember one Friday we used to, we'd go out with you guys. We would go up Friday, Saturday. We were still in our, you know, 20s and none of us had kids and we were going out and doing a lot of stuff, being very social, you know, doing what people do in their 20s on the weekends. And I remember one Friday I came home from work and the thing about what I liked about IMC different than rap is it wasn't late nights. It was not weekends. It was just like banker's hours almost. So I'd be home by 5.30 from the office and I fell asleep on the floor in the living room at 5.45 and didn't wake up. Just was like completely exhausted and spent because of the side hustle plus the day job. And it was around then that I was like, I can't keep this up. This is, I'm not enjoying this. I'm not enjoying like just kind of my life at this phase. It's just too much. And so something had to give. And when we were talking about it, I think my mindset was like, let me just give this a shot. I enjoy, of the two, I enjoy the side hustle more. I enjoy still being a designer, working with clients, solving their business objectives with creative execution. So let's give that a shot. Let me just try that. And if it doesn't take off after a few months, then I can always go back to an agency somewhere. I think that for a lot of people that are very skilled at things, that's a very natural thing. In fact, that was kind of part of the calculus for me was, okay, if I do this and it doesn't work out, I've got these skills and I can go hop back to another consulting firm. So yeah. was that kind of like a, a safety net, a comfort level for you and, and Leandra? Yeah, it definitely was. It was still scary. It's still scary to quit your job when you're about to have a kid and you really don't know what the future holds. It was definitely a leap of faith in a lot of ways, but it was calculated risk. Apart from the idea that, hey, I could go back to another agency, you know, anytime, were there other things that contributed to the confidence of, hey, I think I can take this risk? Well, I think just in general, my faith, right? Like I'm a Christian and I named the company Four Man Furnace. And the story behind that is a story from the Old Testament of the Bible where you know, three Israelites refused to kind of do what was expected of them. And instead they chose to do what's right. And the penalty for that was death. And so they were about to be, the, the means of execution was throwing them in a furnace. And they were about to be thrown in the furnace, which is a scary kind of thing. And their reaction to that was, well, we know we're doing the right thing. This is scary, but we trust that whatever happens is going to be what's supposed to happen. And so I named the company that because I felt like that's what I was going through a little bit at the time. Uh, it was a leap of faith and it was kind of scary, but I knew that whatever happened is what was supposed to happen. So, Man, I have been curious for years what the story behind the name was, and I'm yeah. so glad to finally have that. So we've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that are thrown into the fiery furnace. The fourth man right. was Christ yeah, or the angel of the Lord at the time, because it's an Old Testament story. But yeah, the story literally says when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace to make sure they were dead, he didn't see three men, he saw four, and they were walking around and one appeared to be an angel kind of protecting the group. Man, wow, that's awesome. I love that. I was gonna get to that and I'm so glad, <laughs> so glad you, you brought that up. Okay, all right, so you feel this calling, you feel this confidence, this inspiration to go do this. Are you a one-man show right out of the gate? Did you yeah. have people that you brought with you from day one? What did the early days look like? Yeah, it was great. I loved it. I was a one-man show um, in terms of the company, but I was working with contractors, like copywriters, other designers, web developers, flash animators, like 
every month I would send out seven or eight checks to other people. And I loved it. It was great. I remember like just doing my job and I had a stack of like eight checks I was sending out and I showed them to my wife and I was like, isn't this cool? Like I'm doing this, but it's providing for other people. And that, it was just a good feeling for me. And so it was for a solid two, maybe two and a half years. It was just that model, which I really liked that model too, because what it allowed me to do as a creative director is as a client came to me, I could assemble a team that's right for the creative needs of the project. One of the challenges I had at the agency was we had headcount and we had to justify them. We had to keep them out. We sell hours. So we got to keep these guys billable. So when a new project came in, the people who are there are going to work on it. And it may not be anything that's in their wheelhouse. It may be a project that requires a lot of custom illustration, but nobody's an illustrator. It doesn't matter. Figure it out. Work on it. And so the creative suffers from that model. That was kind of the light bulb going off for me in terms of that really flexible boutique kind of model being valuable, not only to me, but valuable to clients because they don't have to pay the overhead. I always say that you know, with the agency, they're paying for the 500 gallon saltwater fish tank behind the receptionist desk. You know, agencies have a lot of overhead. They've got a lot of bells and whistles. They've got a lot of, you know, just like perks for the employees, this, that, and the other. With the boutique model, it's they're very low overhead. So the agency see, or the client sees savings, but they also see better product because I'm assembling the team that's right for their creative. So I think you talked about the first two, two and a half years. That was the model was you and subcontractors. Were you working from home? Did you have a WeWork space? I guess that was probably even a little early for WeWork. It was a little early for that. There were some co-working things around town. Um, I was working from home until I hired my first employee. And then he would come over to my house, but that got awkward real fast with a newborn and, you know, my wife trying to raise, you know, two-year-old or whatever. And so I had freelanced for an agency right off of 635 and Central in Dallas. So right, what they call the High Five, there's a building there. Uh, And they were like on the 14th floor. And they had actually downsized. They had um, reduced their headcounts. They had extra space. And so we just kind of subletted a room in there that was big enough for two people. I know that for me, hiring my first employee was one of the absolute hardest things that I've had to do in this whole journey. And it had nothing to do with the person. It was all about, okay, I got to make sure that I can feed my own family. And I think your mentality and my mentality are very much the same. I eat last. So I got to make sure that not only can I provide for, you know, them, but then is there going to be enough left over for me? Did that, did you have any of that or was it like, oh, A little bit. I did have a little bit of that. And, you know, there were times when it was like, hey, babe, can you wait until next Thursday to actually go to the grocery store? Like those weeks happened after I hired my first employee. Again, it was a calculated risk. I've never been a big, like just super big risk taker. It's always been really, you know, hedging the bets as best I can. And in this particular case, it actually made more sense to hire him full time than keep him on contract because his hourly rate times 40 hours a week was twice what I would pay him salary. And so that's just what we did as the decision I made. And as the work fluctuated in those early years, it would be, you know, feeling really flush some months and tightening the belt other months for sure. That resonates more than you know. (laughs) So what kind of fears did you have going into it? Mostly not knowing, like, I don't know what I don't know. I've not, I've never took business classes. I'm not a business guy. All of that is just learning as I go. And so I think the biggest fear was just like, I don't even know what questions to ask. I don't know what surprises are around the next corner. I've been taking it one day at a time for 15 years because that's just how I roll. And so, yeah, I think the, the greatest fear is just not knowing what what to anticipate, what problems I can head off at the pass. Did you have any mentors that spoke into your business and into your life early on? No. And you, in your list of pre-podcast prep questions, there was, and it may be coming up in your list too, but there were, one of the questions was, you know, what would you have done differently or something like, or what advice would you give? I'm, I'm totally fast forwarding to the end of the podcast. Sorry. But, um, one of the questions has something to do with that. And my, that was my biggest regret, I guess you could say, is I went to, into it again with that audacity, with that. I can do it and I'll say I can do it and I'll figure it out later. The biggest piece of advice I would give somebody is don't do that. Get a mentor or a partner and don't try to just figure it out on your own because two heads are better than one in these types of situations for sure. 15 years in, have you found a mentor at this point? 
I've got really smart connections now and people who I can bounce questions off of. I don't have a mentor, so to speak, in the sense of like a business mentor that I meet with once a month and we go over things and put together a list of things to work on this next month. But I have some really smart people I can bounce ideas off of ad hoc. I'm now working with kind of a a business partner who comes from a slightly different perspective, but still from the creative industry. It's a guy you know. His name's Rick Gershon. No way! Yeah. I haven't talked to Rick in forever. I know. No way! Yeah, dude. We've done a lot of really good work together, and his career has gone in really, really crazy, interesting, adventurous, like, incredible directions. And so now he is, uh, even on our website as a co-creative director, and... When we work on video projects, he's the heavy hitter. I mean, the guy's got Emmys and... I know he's got at least one Pulitzer Prize. He's got a Pulitzer, he's got Emmys, he's got Webbies, he's got all sorts of accolades for his work. And so, so, and he's just a really smart guy who we complement each other well on the business side, on the analytical side, on the kind of the, the thoughtful planning side. Like I, when we do big shoots, I function as the executive producer and he's the director that kind of describes how we work. He's super discerning, really good with people. You know, he's comes from a, a documentary journalism background. And so he's just real intuitive and can like see pieces moving before they move, which I can't do. But then on the analytical side, on the like managing budgets, timelines, project plans, schedules, I'm good with that. So it's been a really good collaboration over the last year or so formally. And we meet twice a week and just talk through the business, talk through what's happening. And he brings a lot of insight and sheds light on a lot of things that I need light shed onto. We're going to have to talk a little bit more yeah, uh, offline. I had no idea. I texted him right Y'all before I came connected. in here. I was like, guess who I'm about to go talk to? <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's awesome. And I can only imagine how much his talent has grown since I last saw him. I remember when we were regularly all together, the three of us and, and some other folks, I think it was about the time he won the Pulitzer for coverage from Hurricane Katrina. That's right. And I can still vividly remember one of the photos he had taken. Mm. And it was this person's foot with this kind of makeshift shoe. I feel like it was made out of like a, I don't know, a piece of poster board or something. And on the bottom, it said, keep moving. And there was something mm-hmm. so haunting about this photo of somebody that had gone through this incredible tragedy with a hurricane and their feet worn from the journey and these words on the bottom of it was keep moving. And so anyway, wow. Yeah. I can only imagine how much his capability has grown since then. What a, (laughs) what a great partner for you to have. Yeah. It's awesome. That's amazing. So you've been at this for 15 years now, 15 years at Foreman Furnace. Yeah. What does the company look like today? As I mentioned earlier, I latched on to that boutique model of being able to assemble teams based on client needs. At our peak, we were about eight full-time, and that was when we had a couple of retainer clients that just needed us to staff up. And so that was great. We had processes working smoothly and workflows in, in place for these various retainer clients. And then as things kind of shifted, specifically around 2020, when the pandemic hit, A lot of our clients were in travel and hospitality. I mentioned Wyndham Hotels and resorts. And the status of those retainers changed. Retainers just went away. I mean, people, uh, clients in travel and hospitality were not investing in advertising because nobody was traveling or staying at hotels. So that changed. And so we just flexed down. So now we're three full-time, Rick, myself, and then one of my associate creative directors. And then at any point in time, we have, you know, eight to 10 contractors still working. So those checks that I'm sending out every month, at, you know, it's kind of high caliber, hand-selected contractors that we bring in on project basis. Um, So we've always got that bench rotating of contractors. So active talent at any given point in time is, you know, 10 to a dozen, but only three in-house. And again, for the reasons I said earlier, it's it's really a benefit to the client, not for us not to have headcount unless they retain us to have a certain number of headcount. Because at that point, like, let's say... um, I don't know, one of our clients, Goddard Schools, let's say they want to retain us because they've got a curriculum program that needs constant design support for the course of three years. I'm going to put the same people on that for three years because the benefit of the familiarity that creatives bring with process and brand and messaging, and we're able to now start anticipating client needs or building kind of SOPs around quality control for their work and, and those sorts of things. So we will always staff up for retainers if we need to. 
But if we don't have retainers, we'll just, I will employ the minimum number of full-time kind of leadership team staff to manage the bench of contractors that we work with. Makes sense. Something you talked about earlier that I kind of want to come back to and see if or how it has affected you today. You talked about that day that you came home and it was a Friday afternoon and you got home at 5.30 and by 5.40, you're asleep on the floor in the living room. How has your big or bigger agency experience influenced how you set the tone, how you shape the culture for your organization? The camaraderie and team building was always kind of, I think it was a double-edged sword at the agency. Sometimes it felt really necessary and genuinely built friendships. I mean, I'm still in touch with a lot of the people I worked at at RAP, and we still reminisce about the good old days sometimes. On the other hand, it often felt like, okay, we're working you guys to death, so here's some beers on Friday afternoon to kind of make up for it. And it was just, it felt a little bit contrived sometimes. Really, that's a difficult question to answer. I don't know the extent to which that experience has guided the culture building. I mean, the culture that we have is really just around, we care about doing the best work that we can for our clients. Our core values are do amazing work and be amazing to work with. And that's been kind of our recipe for success over the years is, you know, the work needs to be right for the project. It needs to be effective for the client's business. It needs to really look good. We need to be proud of it. Um, And we need to do that in a way that clients want to continue working with us. We want them to see us as leaders as in the creative space. We want them to understand that they can trust us to know what's right and to do what's right. Um, And we want them to enjoy just the channels of communication they have with us. We want to be encouraging and collaborative and all those things. So as long as my team is following those guidelines, everything works out. And with such a small team, I mean, with a team of three, it's pretty easy to keep the morale up. We all get along. Aaron and Rick, we know each other from back in the IBC days as well. Aaron went to the Friday morning men's Bible study and was in our small group back in those days. And so it's kind of just like, you know, it's the guys. It's not good friends. Yeah, it's good friends. There's not a lot of culture building that necessarily needs to take place. I still keep that in mind. It's still important to make sure people are feeling heard and needs are being met and morale's up. But it's low effort. And then with regards to the contractors, it's really just helping them feel valued and maybe insulating them a little bit from the client facing nonsense that they don't have to deal with. When you think about the future of the firm, do you see this being a 20 person, a 50 person, a 500 person firm, or do you like kind of where it is and plan to, to keep it that way? I've never had ambition to grow it to be an X number person firm. Back in the early days, I remember um, having this conversation with a guy who was not a business mentor, but more of just like a personal kind of uh, guy that I met with every now and then just as a personal mentor. He came from a business background. He asked me that same question. This was year one or year two of Four Man Furnace. And I told him, I'm happy how it is, you know, and I still feel that way. Yeah, And I felt that way when it was eight people. I feel that way with three. Again, I kind of take it day by day. And as long as we're enjoying making work for our clients and the clients are appreciating us for the value that we're bringing to their programs, then I'm happy. It could be the three of us. It could maybe be five in the future or just me again. I don't know. But whatever it ends up being, um, if we're if we're accomplishing those goals, then then I'll be happy with it. I think more than a growth goal for the company, I think where I would like to work, kind of a goal that I have to work towards is really being in a position where we get to be a little bit more selective about the clients we work with. Because right now, um, we are selective about the projects we work on, right? There may be projects that we're not cut out for, um, but we're not super selective over the clients that we work with. And so that's kind of the part of the business that's the biggest thorn in my side is every now and then we end up with a client that doesn't really value working with a creative agency. They see us more as skilled labor and less as a creative thought leader. You're just a vendor. Yeah. It's kind of like the person who, you know, has a plumber come over to their house and then tells them how to do their job and exactly what to do. And we find ourselves in that position every now and then. And so I'd like to be able to tell those clients to go away. That resonates a lot. We want to be a partner mm-hmm. and not a vendor. Exactly. We want this to be a long-term mutual kind of a thing where we both not only drive financial benefit, but enjoy working with one another along the way. So 
you've been on your own for 15 years. You've had to do a lot of things. What are the parts of the job that bring you the most joy? So, like I said before, that team collaboration, like just sitting down with the guys and talking about work, making plans for clients, really, I think the most satisfaction comes from when we deliver creative to a client and their reaction to it is just really, really positive. And that happens, that happens a lot. And it's just really, really, that's what we do it for is we want, I always tell clients at the end of the day, you know, what we're creating, whether it's a brand, whether it's a campaign or a series of ads or whatever, this work isn't for you. This work is for your consumers. You are not your consumers in a lot of cases. And so we want you to like the work, but at the end of the day, what you need to understand is you're not the target audience. But all that being said, when they really do love the work and they gush about it or they just, you know, act really excited about it, that's what we do it for. Is it hard for your clients to wrap their head around the idea that they are not the target audience for what you've come up with? Yeah. Whether they admit it or not, some of them just, they refuse to not like the work. You know, and you can tell when they start putting their art director hat on. And we end up in the position, like I said, just skilled labor. Like we're the ones who happen to know Adobe InDesign or Adobe Photoshop. They don't know how to use it. Otherwise, they would just go do it themselves. So they're just telling us what to do. Those are the clients who just don't understand how this process works and what our expertise is, what we can bring to the table. Um, they just don't allow us to do it. And so um, unfortunately, that happens more frequently than we would like. What you just said kind of resonated with me probably for maybe slightly different reasons. I, I talked earlier about that first job I had out of school working for this aviation services company. And while I was not the creative, I, I was working with creative and we had this outside boutique agency. Part of what they did when they came in and designed this great print campaign that was going in different industry magazines, they helped kind of brand the office. They made these giant posters of our different ads that we were running in, in these trade magazines. And I remember after, I don't know, a few months, like telling our creative, we need to change this. Mm. Like, and he goes, no, 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 no. You're saying we need to change this because you're in this office every day. And when you get up to go to the kitchen to get a cup of coffee, you know, you, you see this constantly throughout the day. Your audience is not seeing this, right. you know, constantly all day, every day, like you are. We need to keep this consistent right. and out there. And no, 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 <laughs> we're not changing this just yet. Yeah. So I have an appreciation for what you're saying. Yeah, all of that is just the perspective that people have about how the creative exists out in the market. And some people, I just don't think, have the, a true, really like solid paradigm on how that creative appears or engages with the audience because they're engaging with it from a brand manager perspective or a CMO perspective. And they almost have blinders on. They can only see it from that angle. And so it really does inform, I think, a lot of their opinion and their direction that that we receive from them. And, you know, some of them, you can talk them out of it. Like this story you just, you just relayed, you know, you saw the light. Like that was explained to you. You're like, oh, yeah, I get it. Um, some of them, they just dig their heels in. All right. So you love the joy that comes from revealing things to the customer and showing off your, your hard work. But man, after 15 years and you've had to do everything as a small business owner, as a founder, what are the parts that you just wish could go away? I mean, I think obviously when you're a founder and owner and operator, you're wearing a lot of hats on the administrative side, on the business development side, on the accounting side. Like, So I do all of that and I'm used to a lot of it, but it's just a, a vacuum of time. You know, I don't enjoy that part of the of the work as much, but really the things we were just talking about, about clients that don't trust us to do what we do best and who see us just as a vendor or skilled labor, that's the absolute part that I, I really dislike the most. You obviously took a big risk in starting the firm in the first place. And yeah. you, you mentioned that, you know, faith was a, a big part of, of making that that happen. In addition to taking the initial risk of just going off on your own, You've probably tried some things over time. Has there been anything that you have tried that has not panned out like you hoped it would? Probably the one thing that I tried that I really had hoped would have a good outcome but didn't was I contracted with a lead generation company. 
to, and you know, you get these ads, you get these emails all the time of, you know, we'll send you qualified leads, this, that, and the other. So I decided to respond to a bunch of those, had a bunch of conversations, found a company that I was like, okay, their process, I've, I, I really like their process. I think this is going to work. And they did get me on the phone with a lot of people, but they were just garbage leads, just garbage, just not qualified and not ready to hire us or didn't even know what we did. And, and so that was the biggest, if I had to take one business decision back that I've ever made, it would be that. It's these lead generation companies. And I'm sure they work if you're a plumber or if you're a, you know, an HVAC company, which a lot of people think we are because our name's Foreman Furnace. So <laughs> a lot of people think we are HVAC. But if you're one of those types of companies, I'm sure just hiring one of these lead gen agencies to just funnel people in your direction because you have a service offering that's really easy to understand whether or not you need it. I'm sure that's valuable. But for us, it wasn't. You're like, pouring salt in a wound because <laughs> we we did one of those two uh it's probably a year and a half two years ago and i think you hit the nail on the head if your offering is something that the general market really really understands well then those kinds of things work but when you sell something that requires a little bit more application of thought and understanding just going out and putting a fire hose out there it just it just doesn't work by the way, if somebody listening is in that space or you're a recruiter or a financial advisor or a business advisor, or there's probably five other categories, please stop emailing me <laughs> and please stop sending LinkedIn requests because I'm yeah. just, I'm tired. Oh yeah. I checked my, I, I, it's sadly, I don't pay as much attention to LinkedIn as I should. I probably check it once a week and I was thumbing through it before I came over here and I had a bunch of messages in my inbox. One of them was a legit message from one of my contacts and the rest of them were total noise. It was just, yeah, it's the new junk mail. Yeah. I love LinkedIn and now I'm the volume has just gone through the roof. It has. It's weird. They've changed something in the last six to eight months. I was just going to say the yeah. exact same thing. Yeah. The volume of junk that I get is just through the roof. Yeah. So, all right. So apart from, you talked earlier about wishing that you'd had a more formal mentor relationship in the early days. Yeah. And you talked about the lead gen side of things. If you were going to go back and do this again today, you're talking to your 20 something, early 30 something self. What would you tell them? What would you do differently? I think the biggest thing that I would do differently is when I was feeling good about the client load, having clients on retainer, the mistake that I made when back in 2017, 2018, when we had a couple big retainer clients, we had a decent amount of full-time staff and a whole bunch of contractors working at any given point in time. I was really focused on just keeping that as it was making sure that didn't break. And I didn't capitalize on the momentum. There was an opportunity there, I think, to capitalize on the momentum. And instead of putting all my eggs in one basket with just a couple clients that had big retainers, I could have diversified our clients' kind of client portfolio and maybe spun that momentum off into a business development effort that would have grown that or at least hedged that because when the pandemic hit and those clients by their own business, uh, they had to, they had no other choice but to kind of cut back, that we felt that more than I think we might, had I been a little bit more uh, smart about how I handled it. Real quick, let's take just a couple minutes and talk about the pandemic. This is a, a topic I wish that with our other guests, we'd spend a little bit more time kind of drilling into. February, March of 2020, what was your business like? What was going through your mind? Walk me through that time. Yeah, so it was actually earlier than that. I want to say it was December of 2019. One of our clients is they have high security protocols at their campus. And they were starting to make guests as a part of their sign-in protocol, like sign a form that says that I've not been to China in the last however many weeks. And we thought that was really weird. I mean, in late 2019, I think maybe there were whispers of a virus in China, but nothing really in America yet. And we were just were like, this is this seems really over the top. And so that was the first signal that I had from a business perspective that this pandemic thing, which we didn't even know was a pandemic yet, was um, something to take seriously. I just thought they were being over like overzealous about it. I didn't, they knew something that we didn't know. <laughs> Real quick, just to interject. I can remember December of 20, I'm sorry, 2019, hanging out with some buddies and 
somebody had been watching the news is like, have you seen what's going on in China? Yeah. They're locking people in their homes. Yeah. Can you imagine? That would never happen here. They couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Fast forward uh, 90 days. and Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so then we were joking about that. We went into the winter holidays, took Christmas. Yeah, I think we took a week off, closed the office for a week, came back in January, February. And yeah, things just started becoming tenuous. I think just not just in our industry, just in the country. And so we just kind of followed suit with mainly CDC guidelines. So we transitioned to a work from home model for uh, a couple months. And then they kind of lightened that guidance and we were back in the office a little bit. And then we were back at home. I think we were back in the office for three or four weeks and then we were back at home. So we were just um, riding that out. But it was during the course of that, that our travel and hospitality clients were starting to revisit the state of their retainers. And as those retainers were kind of coming to an end, they weren't being renewed. And so that's where the future became a big question mark in my mind. I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, the middle of 2020, none of us really knew what was going to happen. But specifically to our business and our client roster, I had no clue what the future held. So I just really focused on making sure um, my people were taken care of and that they knew what was going on from a business perspective. We were having regular calls where I was just kind of updating them on, here's where we're at, here's the status of things, here's the status of our clients. If things need to change, you know, you guys are going to get plenty of warning and just really making sure that they felt like they knew what was going on with the business. Have you made any lasting changes in your business because of the pandemic or has it kind of cycled back to where it was before? I don't think there have been any lasting changes in our process or just general methodology or, or the mindset to how we do business. I think that was, yeah, I think the pandemic was just kind of, we had to adjust for what was happening in the world. You know, as you can imagine, video production ground to a halt. People weren't going on set. People weren't getting in a room and hiring a crew and coming in. to. So that all just kind of stopped for a little while and only really just got back to what I would call quote unquote normal end of last year. Uh, we were shooting in New York and um, there were some protocols like pandemic level in Manhattan. There were some like pandemic level protocols that we were having to figure out. This was September of last year. We were working around some of that. But um, I think just after that is when, the, you know, a, a typical film production got back to normal, so to speak. Over the course of the next decade, I'm sure there's going to be a lot written said and researched about the effects of the pandemic. And um, when we get to 2030, I'm really eager to see what people have to say looking back crazy. Specifically to our industry and what we do in creative for brands, I think the pandemic actually did shift. I think it accelerated a trajectory that our business was on, which was really Leading up to that, we saw as social media became more prevalent and platforms like TikTok and, you know, Instagram Reels and Facebook Reels became more popular, the value of what we do as emotional storytellers was slowly decreasing. Clients were less likely to spend $100,000 on a series of two or three really moving emotional high, like cinematic narrative films and more likely to spend half that money on two dozen 15-second TikTok, you know, UGC-level quality pieces. So that trajectory we saw happening, and then the pandemic hit, and I think it just fast-forwarded all of that. And I think where we're at now is clients, and I've heard this directly from clients, we're trying to do more for less. They want more volume, less quality, less expense which is something that we're adjusting to. And I think when you fast forward to 2030, it's like, how do we adjust what we do as storytellers and filmmakers and brand strategists? How do we adapt that to a world that's increasingly becoming more short form, low production quality, kitschy, and in a world of where AI is now a tool that we use for creative and eventually a tool clients might use for creative without us. Um, how do we adapt to those types of things? So that's kind of what we're we're looking forward and trying to figure out actively right now. Has the influencer movement, if you will, impacted your business? I don't know. Uh, so our business, as it pertains to kind of the requests that we get from clients, the leads we get for bigger projects, there's less of a demand for bigger projects. 
I don't know necessarily what to attribute that to. I'm sure this idea of influencer or or even if it's not influencer, or even if it's just lightweight, smaller, less expensive, more bite-sized social content, that's just in general overtaking the idea of a six-minute short documentary about a person in a, in a narrative style that's very cinematic and emotional. I think that just less of an appetite for that. And it could be influencer, you know, style con. It's pretty easy to spend thirty, forty thousand dollars to get somebody who's influential in social media to promote your brand versus thirty or forty thousand dollars to create a really beautiful film that maybe, I don't know, just as many people will see or maybe less people will see. I don't know. All right. Well, kind of coming down the home stretch here, what's been the biggest surprise in your 15 years of running four man furnace? I don't know if there's been a whole lot of surprises. We keep our ear to the ground. And like I said, I, I stay pretty nimble. The pandemic was a huge left hook. I don't think any of us really saw that coming. Yeah, nothing has really shocked me. I mean, there's been lots of small surprises like, oh, this client, a client's response to some work or something like that. But that just comes with the cost of doing business. Yeah, nothing I would say was a real big shocker in the last 15 years. Industry agnostic, whether it's advertising or tech consulting or starting a manufacturing business, do you have any just general advice to somebody who's thinking about hanging a shingle and starting their own thing? Get a mentor. That's the first thing I would say is don't try to do it yourself. No matter how audacious and self-confident you are (laughs) undeservedly, it's always better to have somebody to bounce ideas off of. Even if you are super smart and you do know what you're doing and you, you know, listen to the podcast and read the books and follow all the YouTubers and, you know, really have your ear to the ground and and kind of have an idea of how it will work or be successful. It never hurts to have somebody, an objective outsider with fresh eyes to look at what you're doing and say, hey, have you thought about maybe doing this instead? I think that for me specifically, that would have helped had I had that partner or mentor much earlier on. I'm going to build on that for just a second and say that the more self-confident you are and the more you think you've got it all figured out, the more you probably hundred percent need a mentor. Yeah, if you don't think you need a mentor, that's the sign that you definitely, you definitely need a mentor. Everybody needs one, yeah. but if you don't think you need one, yeah. you definitely need yeah. one. That was Steve Derman, founder and creative director of Four Man Furnace. To learn more, visit 4MF.co. That's the number four, M as in Mike, F as in Foxtrot, dot co. If you or a founder you know would like to be a guest on In the Thick of It, email us at intro at founderstory.us. 